it's very important for us from Syriza and uh, in part of the Greek people to, to thank you uh, for the solidarity that you are showing to the Greek tragedy, to the tragedy that the Greek people, the Greek society uh, experiences in the last uh, four years. And uh, I will try to uh, focus mostly on uh, three issues. Uh, the first issue will be, uh, I will try to sketch a little bit uh, an alternative interpretation of uh, the Eurozone debt or banking crisis, but I will not focus very much on that because that will be part of uh, Ms. Ellison's uh, presentation as well. And I will try to focus mostly on uh, the policies, the austerity policies uh, that are pursued in Greece uh, from the Greek government on the one hand, but under the directions uh, of the Troika, the European Commission, the European Central Bank and the IMF. And in the end, I will try to focus a little bit in what we think uh, that are the alternatives uh, for, such, for this uh, situation. So I will, if you don't mind, I will read some of the things uh, from here. So I will try not to speak very uh, fast uh, because of the problems that we may have for the translation. So uh, we could say, for example, that uh, there are two big groups uh, of causes of this crisis uh, which have nothing to do with the mainstream interpretation of the crisis. Uh, the mainstream uh, interpretation has to do, uh, for example, with the fact that was mentioned yesterday as well, that uh, the countries in the periphery of the Eurozone uh, tend to, tended to consume more than they were producing, that people in the South are less productive and more lazy than people in the North, but we all of us know very well that this kind of moral and ethical explanations of the crisis cannot be true because we have a very deep and structural crisis that takes place not only to one country, but takes place in a very large area of countries. So the first group uh, that of explanation uh, that I can use is that the countries of the Eurozone periphery, uh, first of all, th there are spe very specific social and historical reasons that has to do why, with the reasons that why this crisis started and has such a big extent in these countries. So the countries of the Eurozone periphery, uh, before joining the European Union, exhibited a significant lag in their capitalist development in relation to the rest of the Europe. So one of their main characteristics is that while in the post-war period, the welfare state was formed in an extremely fast pace in the rest of Europe under the social democratic consensus, and uh, while in these countries it was totally absent for specific historical and political reasons. Unemployment, income inequality, poverty, all these in these countries were very high. So in order uh, to try to catch up with the rest of the Europe, what took place was uh, a large, a very fast increase in uh, the, the role of the financial sector in these countries. So this took place uh, according to the social and political conditions in uh, these countries. In Greece, for example, uh, this financial expansion took place through the public sector. And this took place mostly because the banks were under the public state uh, control and there was no uh, financi uh, banking uh, liberalization until the middle uh, 1990s. Uh, so what we had in Greece was that in order the governments to try to uh, keep the society together, to, pro to, to secure a neoliberal uh, consensus from the people, what they were doing was that they had the government borrowing from the 
banks, uh, something that was very profitable for the banks, and at the same time they were keeping taxes for the capital very low, and at the same time they were blinking to some very concrete uh, uh, capital uh, categories, capitalist categories, uh, through uh, tax evasion. For this reason, uh, we had very big uh, budget deficits in Greece that were financed by banks. And that's how this uh, huge public debt was accumulated through the last years. And what we have to say and to underline is that these deficits were not created by very high public expenditures, by very high welfare state expenditures, but from very low taxes, from very low taxation, or especially from uh, on the side of the capital. In the rest of the, Euro of the Eurozone periphery countries, especially in Ireland and, uh, and uh, Spain, we had a private sector debt. So in these countries, uh, the, in order uh, to have a neoliberal consensus, to have the people, uh, to have a consensus from the people under the neoliberal policies, what this government did was they liberalized the private, uh, the banks. So the banks, through uh, lending to households, they created all this consensus uh, in the age of neoliberalism. But as we know, uh, d uh, credit creates debt, and too much credit creates this debt crisis. So that's in the very center of our narrative for this crisis. But this is not the only group of reasons for this crisis. The other very broad uh, group of reasons for this crisis has to do with the Eurozone architecture. Uh, we know very well that something was going wrong from, from the very beginning uh, that Eurozone started operating. Uh, the circulation of capital flows uh, from the most developed economies in the monetary union uh, to the least developed uh, actually constitutes a rule of political economy and its empirical validation was something to be expected in the case of the Eurozone. The widening trade deficits of the less developed countries, the countries of the periphery, reflect the widening trade surpluses of the core economies. So the peripheral countries finance their deficits through the large amount of capitals they have accumulated in the form of debt from the countries of the core. If we add to all these things, if we add the, the, the strong austerity policies imposed by the European Central Bank from the Maastricht Treaty, we have, uh, there are a ver these are very good reasons why we had this crisis in the Eurozone. But now let me turn a little bit to what is happening to the Greek case. Uh, most of the people probably uh, read what is happening to Greece. Uh, you may see some riots in demonstrations that take place, or you may listen to the negotiations that take place from the side of the Greek governments with the Troika. But the very important thing is to try to focus on what is happening, what is the social situation, and what is the economic situation after about three and a half years of imposing this kind of policies in Greece. First of all, Three and a half years ago, when the first bailout program was imposed by the social democratic government of PASOK and George Papandreou, uh, they were telling us, they were saying to the people, both the Troika and the government, that uh, we will impose this program in order uh, that in 2011, two years ago actually, uh, the Greek government will be able to go out to the markets and be able to borrow from the markets again. Uh, at that time, the Greek public debt was 115% of GDP. Uh, right now, actually three and a half years later, the Greek public debt is 175% of the GDP. So the, 
the declared goal of this program was that we will go back to the markets, that we will have a sustainable debt. So the declared goal is absolutely failed. However, we know very well that behind that goal, the, behind that target of the sustainability of the public debt, they were uh, hiding other uh, implicit targets from the side of the Troika and of the Greek government. This implicit target was actually the internal devaluation of the Greek economy, it was to try to have a shock doctrine, actually, as Naomi Klein says in her book, a shock doctrine in the Greek society in order, uh, under the fear of the very big public debt, to, to restructure the whole Greek capitalism. And when we say restructure, you know very well in Serbia as well, as in every other country in Europe, that this means to lower wages, to, di to dismantle the welfare state, to privatize everything. It's this whole neoliberal agenda that is imposed uh, by uh, the governments and the European Union institutions as well. That was the situation in Greece. We have an unemployment that uh, two months ago was estimated in 28% in Greece. At the moment that we entered this bailout program three years ago, unemployment was 8%. Imagine we have a 20% increase of unemployment in three years. In five years, uh, the Greek economy has lost 25% of GDP, if you can imagine that. This is the largest uh, recession that has taken place in capitalist history. It's even larger than uh, the United States depression after the uh, crash of the 90, uh, 1990s. And uh, at the same time, uh, we have a poverty of uh, 35%. Uh, in Greek society, uh, and these are the quantitative uh, implications of this crisis because there are other implications that cannot be quantified. For example, uh, who can talk about what is the, the, the problem right now, the democratic crisis that takes place in Greece because of the social crisis? Who can, t who can quantify what is the damage in Greek democracy through what we see in the last years, actually, with uh, this kind of phenomenon of the rising of fascist and neo-Nazi groups uh, like the Golden Dawn? Who can quantify uh, the effects uh, that this economic and social crisis has to people's everyday life when we have, for example, about uh, 3,500 uh, suicides during the last three years. That is uh, more than double of the suicides that we had in the previous years before the crisis. And at the same time, all this, as it seems right now under these policies, uh, does not have uh, any, there, there is no light in the end of the tunnel. I don't know how t much time I have. Okay. Ten, uh, minutes. Ten, ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay, so I have some time. Uh, the problem right now uh, with uh, the policies with that uh, are imposed in Greece is uh, that actually we have a vicious cycle. We have a vicious cycle in terms of an austerity policy that is imposed in order to deal with the problem, but actually it generates the problem. And I can explain you why. On the one hand, we have a fiscal vicious cycle. They are imposing austerity by cutting uh, public spending and by increasing taxes, but at the same time, these measures uh, generate more uh, public deficits because when you uh, decrease the disposable income of the people, these people do not have money to pay their taxes. 
or when you increase unemployment in such a percentage, as I told you before, 28%, you have to pay the unemployment benefits. So we see these uh, uh, counter effects at the same time that while they are trying to diminish the fiscal deficits, they have strong pref pressures of increasing the deficits because of the policy that they create. And at the same time, we have another vicious cycle that has to do with the banking system. They are spending huge amounts of capital uh, from the money that, we, that Greece borrows from uh, the, European, uh, uh, the European stability mechanism in order to recap recapitalize the Greek banks. But at the same time, because people do not have money, they cannot repay their loans that they have borrowed from the banks. So they always need more and more money in order to have sufficient funds to recapitalize the Greek banking system. And that's how this vicious cycle operates. The problem, the biggest problem, is that these kind of policies are not only imposed to Greece, they are being imposed in all uh, the peripheral, peripheral countries of the Eurozone, but not only to the periphery, but everywhere in the Eurozone and the European Union as well. We see that uh, a few months ago there was this uh, famous six-pack of economic policy for the European Union. In a way, they tried to uh, extend the bailout program of Greece uh, to all uh, the European economies, the European Union economies, by strong surveillance of uh, fiscal deficits, by impose, imposing sanctions when you had large trade deficits, and in a way they try to constitute consti institutionalize uh, austerity in uh, European Union. And uh, so the big question that arises uh, is what are the alternatives towards such uh, a policy? What is really interesting is that at the beginning of the crisis, uh, European left, and Syriza was a part of this European left uh, thought, uh, we had a very specific orientation and a very specific critique to this kind of policies imposed in the European Union and in Greece particularly. The interesting thing is that after three and a half years, larger and larger sections of the mainstream uh, economists or even you can read articles and articles in mainstream international media, such as in Financial Times or New York Times, that there are people uh, admitting that this kind of policy cannot work in the Eurozone. So we, complete, we need an entirely different uh, policy in the Eurozone, a policy completely in the opposite of this austerity uh, policies pursued in the European Union. So what is needed right now in terms of a whole for the, Europe for the Eurozone is a, a completely different role of the European Central Bank. The European Central Bank needs to play the role that every central bank plays in the world. That means uh, the role of the lender of last resort that means that uh, we, the European Central Bank will be able to bail out countries or to finance uh, countries that cope with liquidity uh, problems. And at the same time, we will need a completely different role of fiscal policy in uh, the European Union, in the Eurozone. We need the more active role of, European, of fiscal policy in the European Union. Uh, that means uh, that countries that, have, that are in a deep recession uh, need to be financed from a common European Union uh, budget uh, to, to finance public investments in this country in order to be able to create the conditions for growth. 
But in order to deal specific with the debt crisis, we need uh, some very specific measures. For example, in, country, in countries where the public debt is very high and not sustainable, uh, as Greece or in, as Portugal, Italy, and uh, other countries, uh, we need th this debt needs a part of this debt, a large part of this debt needs to be cancelled out, because uh, it's impossible to repay this kind of debt. And uh, if we don't want to uh, to uh, repeat the same mistakes that the international community do, uh, did after the First World War, uh, when they imposed uh, these very big uh, repayment conditions to the Germans, uh, we should deal with these problems uh, right now. So a big part of these public debts needs to be cancelled out. But at the same time, we need uh, to have a completely different regulation of the financial and banking system. Uh, there are a lot of proposals worldwide uh, about uh, how uh, the financial system can be regulated, and uh, these are part of our agenda. But in order to, to finish uh, my speech, uh, we know very well that in order to do all these things, uh, what is needed is to uh, have, is to try to create uh, political alliances and social alliances within uh, the countries, in a national level, but also in an international European level as well. Uh, you know, you may know very well that uh, this is uh, the strategy of the Greek left right now in Greece. Uh, the situation, the social situation is very bad, but uh, as it seems, there is some optimism in terms of uh, the political developments. Uh, right now, Syriza, in, the, in most of the polls, is the first party. So we really believe that uh, there are the conditions in order to try to, to invest in a counter example in one country in order to try to promote these things to other countries as well in the terms of the European Union.